The causes of the problem are complex. They involve not only natural changes, but changes brought on by humans. Many believe that sitting back and doing nothing is not a good option. If we were not working on the juniper control on our property, I think the junipers would eventually take over and um, we would have very little forage for either our cattle or wildlife and uh, the wildlife for sure would move on. So it's not a very good picture if we don't control the junipers. Active management is very important that we can't afford to let quote nature take its course because we've had such an impact on these systems and so we would like to steer where these systems go and in the absence of any kind of disturbance these trees are going to dominate the landscape. To help address the problem researchers have developed a system for identifying levels of juniper domination. There are three phases of juniper encroachment. Phase one is when trees have just come into a plant community and but the shrubs and the grasses are still you know controlling that site and you may not even see the trees. The trees may be hiding under a little sagebrush uh, bush before it pops out. Phase two is when you start seeing a kind of a co-dominance of shrubs, grasses, and trees in the area. You may have a lot of little trees in the area, but you also have a few taller trees intermixed there. And that's, this phase two tends to be when we also can tend to uh, get our high, highest wildlife diversity, particularly birds. With phase three, this is an area where juniper is dominating the site and your shrubs either either out of the system or much reduced and your understory is in the same, same condition much reduced and you lack surface fuels to carry that fire through that system. Breaking this chain of events means removing some, but not necessarily all, of the post-settlement juniper using a variety of tools. We've done a lot of both mechanical uh, cutting and chainsaw. We um, cut the junipers not as a clear cut but as a mosaic because we feel like that the wildlife need to have escape routes and and so we never ever do a, a complete clear cut we always leave wildlife a habitat for you know the the elk or the deer moving from one place to the other we're not looking at necessarily moving all the trees in fact many projects require leaving a few per acre and in most cases when you do a mechanical treatment you don't get the little trees and in 15 or 20 years they're back and that's one of the disadvantages with mechanical treatments is you do have to come back in and retreat these areas fairly quickly after you have done your first one. A very effective means of controlling juniper is reintroducing fire into the system, burning cut juniper and conducting prescribed burns that emulate the original natural disturbance cycles. What we're finding now is on these phase three woodlands uh, real successful methods been employed by uh, some of the BLM districts in our area is uh, combinations of cutting and after you let the trees dry you have sufficient surface fuels to carry that fire through that area and remove the remaining live trees. Our treatment now is to go into a field that has large juniper trees and we fall all the juniper trees that are 120 years old and younger leave the old guys up on the rims that are four and five hundred years old we leave those alone and then in five to eight years, we come back in there and burn the whole field. The results of juniper control have been promising. I guess one of the, the um, biggest things we've seen is the increase in native forage that has um, come because of the juniper cutting. Grass, like you wouldn't believe, you know, there's more grass on a section than there was on the whole ranch before. Or not that, you know, that's exaggerating, but yeah, it really produced a lot of feed. Since we got rid of the juniper trees, or we, we never get rid of them, since we knocked them back, we have all the different plants that come, the diversity that animals need, it's very, very noticeable with the amount of bugs and then birds and then larger animals that are in there, and plus the feed is about a, a 10 to 1 ratio. Forage production isn't just for uh, livestock. Um, you do get, on most of these treatments, we are seeing about a two to tenfold increase in the forage base. And part of that's made up with an increase in grass, and that's primarily what cows are gonna concentrate on, and also elk and deer. 
Uh, and then you get a large increase in flowering plants, which are beneficial to a number of wildlife species from insects to birds and, and small mammals. Land managers and landowners aren't acting on their own. Research plays a big role in figuring out what works and what doesn't. There's been a host of different kinds of studies done uh, in the juniper woodlands. Okay, our research has involved soils, plants, uh, bird species, moths, small mammals. We try to take some of the information that's been developed by the researchers and then take it and apply it on a broader scale across the landscape. There's also another component to that is, is the researchers will come out and look at some of the things we're doing and trying in the field and they'll take that back and develop scientifically testable uh, projects and try to give us information back to see if we're achieving our objectives that we believe we're, we're shooting for. I, I kind of view all of our actions on the ground as one big kind of science project and we're learning as we go. I, I don't like to, to think of things as failures if, if we don't get the results we want. I only think it's a failure if we, if we continue to do the same thing over and over again and don't learn from what we've done in the past. Juniper doesn't recognize fences, forcing land managers and owners to take a wider view to address the problem. The ownership pattern out here is a complex mosaic of public and private land, and it's not just BLM and, and private land, it's BLM, Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and, and some other federal agencies. The juniper plant communities don't respect those boundaries. They've gone beyond those boundaries. So when we, we try to design a management action, we try not to make it a square edge. and We try to, to include the landscape in, in consideration, so that means we'll have to go outside of tr traditional boundaries and apply our, our management action that way. So we have to kind of bring everybody together and do that. And, and sometimes it's very easy, because sometimes it's very difficult, because we may not all have exactly the same objective. And local officials can find it even more challenging when these objectives can involve outside perspectives and environmental groups. We need local control and local flexibility to manage all of our environment. Uh, you can't compare Harney County to the Willamette Valley, certainly. What we've tried to do as we address the concerns of environmental groups and try and be on a collaborative or cooperative effort has been we tend to focus on, on the value of economic, social, and environmental when we talk to them. I think there has been some change from, in particular, the environmental community. We've had to learn trust of each other, had to work together, and I think that's helped. Juniper has been a part of this landscape for thousands of years. In many ways, Juniper defines this landscape. It provides a sense of place and has deep roots in the lives and culture of residents. That makes Juniper management a complex issue, one that crosses many ownership boundaries with economic, ecological, and even emotional effects. The dramatic increase in western juniper over the past 100 years has had negative impacts on native plant communities and our watersheds. If we want to restore those plant communities and watersheds, managing juniper will be critical. It doesn't really matter whether your interest is water, wildlife, biodiversity, or cattle. We all want healthy watersheds. By managing juniper, we can improve our water quality improve the forage quantity for wildlife and cattle, increase biodiversity, and promote healthy watersheds. Humans have always had a large impact on this area, the whole, the whole continent. So we have to decide that yes, we are part of this ecosystem and we are going to have to manage it for whatever our goals are and we're going to have to decide what those goals are as a society. Even the cow business, well, grass is what you need. You don't, it can't feed a juniper to a cow very good. Yes, they love seeing those big old junipers and, and being in them and the smell of them after uh, a rain. All of those are very important values to us. At the same time, we know it's hurting the environment. 
I truly believe that uh, the public is not as educated as somehow we need to get them on the damage that the uh, junipers are doing to our watershed.